Welcome to the Cinematologist Podcast, Season 11. I'm Daryl Linares, and down the line, of course, is my good friend, Dr. Neil Fox. Neil, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm excited about Season 11. I can't believe, can't believe it's, it's Season 11. Yeah, It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's funny because, obviously, we, we've trailed a little bit doing the, the 100th episode coming up, and this is being Season 11, and sometimes I feel bad because, you know, there's people putting podcasts out one a day or <laughs> twice a week, and they're up to so many, but, I, you know, I, I reconcile myself with the... The fact that I think there's a lot in our podcasts, you know what I mean? There's there's a lot of depth in there, and they take they take a bit of organising. So uh, I think it's it's a bit of a milestone. I think getting to season eleven and a hundred to come. Yeah, I think so. I think that there's something to be said about the the kind of the content that we do and the way we do it that means it works really well for us to to kind of release when as and when we do. And I think that you know I think that's why people have stayed with us. To be honest with you, I think because because they know what they're getting in terms of the quality and the quantity and uh, it's not overwhelming which is something that's kind of quite rare I think in the the modern kind of cultural climate. Absolutely and um, we're gearing up to go to Berlin again which very is going to be yeah very very much looking forward to it going to be great fun we're both on the the press passes so I've, I've, I've said I don't know about you but I've said to myself that I'm, I'm going to limit myself to three films a day just so I don't kind of over overface myself, and I, I also want that sort of reflection and taping and a little bit of writing time in between films. So that's my that's my 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 one rule for Berlin. But apart from that, kind of anything goes. Cool. Yeah, I, I've tried to try to keep it reasonable. I think there's one day I might do four, but there's another day I might do two because of, sort of when things fall. Because I get there quite late in the in the cycle of it. But yeah, what's exciting as well is that both of us will be there for a day together. So we'll get to. As opposed to last time, we were literally ships that passed in the night. This time, we'll be able to watch a movie together and, and kind of talk about it, maybe a couple. And uh, I'm really excited about that. You know, t- t- taping live from Berlin after a screening, I think it's going to be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some filmmakers that, that have featured a lot on the podcast as well, Kelly Reichart, Hong Sang Su, uh, Sally Potter. I don't think we've, I mean, we've talked about, but not really gone in depth with. So it might might be a good opportunity to talk about her films yeah absolutely yeah i'm very excited about that new simon ling as well which yep. which i'll catch i think that's just after you leave but he's obviously a yeah. filmmaker who comes up quite a lot so yeah and uh, there'll be some familiar voices as well because there's quite a few people that we know hanging yep. around so that'd be nice indeed yeah before we get into the main meat of the episode there was a bfi release that you wanted to just mention yeah just uh, so the bfi re- are re-releasing Michael Caton Jones's scandal um, about the Profumo affair with John Hurt and uh, Joanne Wally and Ian McKellen, and it's uh, it's interesting because obviously there was a recent TV show. Uh, was it Hugh Grant? Was it it? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see it, but um, the in-laws said it was very good. So uh, they're they're very discerning in their TV taste. So, but um, yeah, I was kind of keen to revisit it because it was a film that you know, if if I'm being blatantly honest, was an early of an early crush for me you know Joanne Wally in mm. Scandal was one of my first <laughs> kind of screen crushes just found it absolutely mesmerizing it was a film that I enjoyed on a an aesthetic level when I was when I was young a young man yeah so I was keen to revisit and I hadn't really paid attention to it as a film at all before but what I really enjoyed about rewatching it was realizing what a well-crafted film it is from what is a very complex real real story and how it kind of fixates on this kind of central friendship between Joanne Wally's character Catherine Keeler and uh, Stephen Ward um, John Hurt's character who's this doctor who kind of brings her into the the world of the establishment and society and, and things like that when she's a very very young woman sure, um, sure and and how that kind of frames the film and just those two performances and the the kind of the relationship between the two actors is is so well so well observed and so so believable in terms of the the kind of the, the complex friendship that emerges of it. I think it's a really great kind of set of performances. And then the film around it, I just found a really stylish film. And what was interesting was realizing that one of the things that really attracted me to the film on an aesthetic level is just how Michael Caton Jones shoots Joanne Wally, like the Catherine Keeler character, as this kind of classic Hollywood star. The way she's lit is so beautiful and so kind of classic it really you just feel her kind of star presence as a 
as a character and yeah. it just sells the both the kind of the glamorous kind of sexual kind of side of that story but also the the deeply troubling aspect of it of how young she was and, and how she was kind of co-opted into into this uh, into this world which which kind yeah. of was interesting to watch again and and realize what what the film is doing in terms of both highlighting that kind of uh, that kind of glamour and that kind of gaze, but also how that's kind of problematic in itself, which I thought was really interesting. There's all, there's almost an Ava Gardner aesthetic, I think. Absolutely, yeah. In, in, in the way she looks, but also the way she's shot, which is interesting, yeah. I think. Yeah, and just, yeah, the, the lighting and where she is in the frame and these kind of classic compositions, it's really striking to... And it looks beautiful, you know, it's a, a, fil a film that looks beautiful and really enjoyable revisit. And uh, yeah, some really good features on there as well. So well worth checking out that release. Have you seen anything that you're you wanted to flag up there? Yeah. yeah, well, just just interestingly, I mean, coming on to th this notion of rewatching, what your attitude is to a film that you've seen long ago, or or you may have seen, you know, in the medium term, but then watching it again and and with somebody else and having a a different opinion, and and it's it's been interesting watching some of the films for the Voice episode that's coming up. So I, so I've I've had on Inherent Vice, I've had on Anomalisa, but but really the one that sort of just surprised me was only lovers left alive because i was kind of you know i wasn't totally that this has blown me away but my word sort of just having it on the on the computer and sort of listening to the minutiae of the sound has really given me a sort of deeper appreciation for that and then interestingly we watched last night we, we, we were doing that thing where we were scrolling and scrolling trying to find something to 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 watch that you know isn't too overly difficult but not just trash and we came across 2010, you know, the uh, the sequel to 2001. Oh, and it, the year they make contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, I hadn't seen it in God, God knows how long. And B had never seen it. She said, what, there's a sequel to 2001? And I said, yeah, and it's actually, it tries to be a kind of serious sequel. And she's, get out of here. And then I noticed that the director was Peter Hyams, yeah. who did Capricorn 1 yeah. and Outland, of course. And we, we, we watched it, and, and it is clunky, particularly in terms of the, the, the special effects and stuff. I mean, it's, it's interesting how, however many years later, 20 odd years later, the, the, the special effects work better in the original. But it really sort of, it, it tries to be, you know, reverential, but also do something new with the original, give it a kind of scientific um, and almost so, so socio-political uh, context so Helen Mirren is in it as a Russian astronaut she's the captain of the of the of the Russian craft because the Americans basically have to hitch a ride with the Russians while there's this whole sort of nuclear standoff ha ha going on on earth so they these guys are sort of having to work together in space and there's like nuclear war imminent back on earth um, but it really sort of made me think about how solid a director I think Peter Hyams is he's, he's kind of like one of these people who'd never be considered you know, as an auteur or anything like that. And then later on in his career, he sort of was doing John claude Van Damme movies. Do you know what I mean? So it's, you know, it, he's obviously landed in the place where he's just, he's sort of making money for the directorial job. But I'd, I'd, I'd tell you something, he's still alive. I'd love to get Peter Hyams on the podcast. That would be somebody interesting to speak to. Yeah, I think so. I think because he he's a director from an age where it was it was more respected to just ch to churn out good watchable movies you yeah. know and we've talked about this before haven't we where there's there's this sense that everything has to be world beating and it has yeah, to yeah, change yeah, the yeah. world or it's garbage and it's like well no actually like there is most of the films that you watch have ever watched are kind of good solid you know yeah. of, of their time movies um yeah I, I, he'd be yeah he'd be fascinating to because yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it, it's a career that you don't really see that kind of career anymore. No, yeah. no, that's right. And and Schneid, Schneider's in it, and John John Lithgow. Yeah. So it's it's just got it's got, it's got solid people in it, and and you forgive it its shortcomings because yeah. of, because of that. Do you know what I mean? Great. Yeah. And it's interesting you're sort of saying about the VFX because in the uh, the episode today Kubrick comes up quite a lot, and um, in the book that I was talking to the critic about, he talks very much about that kind of the effects in two thousand and one and how because of what Kubrick does and how he sees that world, they are kind of better than any of, our, any of the other sci-fi movies because they're not really sci-fi in the way that 
other movies are. So yeah, yeah, interesting yeah, that you yeah, saw yeah. that uh, saw that recently. Where was that? Because I haven't seen that pop up as. It's on. It it was on. It was just on streaming. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think it was on. Um, I think we just got it on Amazon Prime. Cool. Great. Good stuff. So, who is the esteemed critic that that you got a good chunk of time with today? So today's episode is a conversation that I had with Adam Mars Jones, who writes for a number of places: the Times Literary Supplement and. Uh, the London Review of Books, amongst other places. He's a novelist and he was the Independent's first film critic. So he was a national critic for the for the Independent when they were launched for a, a long time. So kind of weekly national film critic. And, and late last year, he released a, a book of kind of selected writings on film that kind of collected a lot of his, well, not a lot, but, you know, a substantial amount of his of his film reviews for the independent and some longer pieces for some different places like the spectator and uh yeah just we got we got sent an email as we do now and uh looked like a, an interesting read and it's a it's a book that both collects the reviews but also his thoughts on the the films that he's talking about the reviews themselves and himself as a writer and also what's changed for him in that intervening period between when they were written and and now and uh, how he kind of conceives of a career writing film criticism. So I was in London for an exam board and darted across and hung out in his kitchen talking about movies for an hour. And it was really, really fun. It was, yeah, I had a really good time. He was very welcoming and just really interesting and interested. And what was great was he's just, he's so comfortable in his opinion. <laughs> that, that is something that I think we can talk about afterwards. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so that was that was fun yeah so hopefully people will enjoy this uh conversation that uh, i had last week yeah fantastic so uh, like yeah let's go to that now dave do you mind if i ask you a personal question no not at all i've wondered whether you might be adding some second thoughts about the mission how do you mean Rumours about something being dug up on the moon. I never gave these stories much credence, but particularly in view of some of the other things that have happened, I find them difficult to put out of my mind. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What are you talking about, Hal? This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. I won't get the book out and uh, embarrass you. Well, because you've scrawled over it and everywhere. No! What is he talking about here? Completely. I think I. I think there was only there was only a couple of times actually. I. Uh, I dis. Well, not disagree. I was like, okay, I, I, I see what you're saying, but I could read it differently. Example. Um, <laughs> I think I wrote it. I'll have a look. Was well, something I liked and you hated, or the other way around? Um. Let me see. Uh, oh, I think it was. Uh, it was about shortcuts. Right, um, so it was great. 
Yeah, but just in terms of one of the kind of the 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 the, the, the reading of it in terms of the, the bitterness and cynicism. Uh, what the, well, is it, yeah. that was kind of not not akin to Carver, but I just thought, yeah, I you know, uh, but felt felt you could sort of read it more in a in a kind of L.A. bitterness and kind of Altman's bitterness about L.A., which also comes through in the player, I think, and Hollywood as a thing that. Except the player is so soft centered. I mean, yeah. only they managed to resist Bruce Willis and and what's her face, uh, Julia Roberts. Yeah, yeah. I see. But that, yeah, other, otherwise I was kind of like, there's lots of things where I'm going like. Yes, <laughs> uh, particularly about Galaxy Quest, which I used to teach. Galaxy Quest when I used to teach. Well, it's um, one of those films that I've never remember seeing the preview, and it's one of those things where you think this is so much better than it needs to be. Yeah, uh, and you don't often get that, uh, get that. And everybody's invested in it just the right way. You know, like all the cast are so they just they know exactly what they're making in a kind of like it is smart, but it's also silly. Um, but kind of taking it as seriously as those actors would have in those like the B movies, you know, that it's kind of aping. I just thought, I just think it's pitch perfect. And also very clever about, yeah, kind of Hollywood and fandom particularly. Yeah, they've also spent enough money on the special effects to, uh, that you actually don't have to work with the special effects. They work with you. Yeah, which is absolutely. Also, uh, I'm, I'm sad. I'm, one thing I love about films is you can teach literature students and they all watch films. Whereas yeah. if you talk to a class of film students, they don't read books in the same way, I don't think. No, uh, I think that's um, yeah. I think that's definitely a truism, isn't it? That you, and everybody seems to have, yeah, the the, kind of the authority on on films from a yeah. kind of which is which is because of its popular nature. But also, thanks to YouTube, you can show them stuff they don't know. When yeah. they say, and students have told me, oh, look at the greatest films ever made. It's got to be Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. You think, no, really doesn't. <laughs> but so if you just show a clever student some of the special effects in Cocteau. And they just go, wow, I just yeah. did not know you could think like that. But it's, it's the thinking like that, not the doing like that, that is is so striking. Yeah. You know, how did he come up with that stuff, I suppose? Because he had to improvise. Everything had to be a bit magical and like, like part of the game. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And yeah, the, the kind of the limitations of, of, the, of the form at the time and also, you know, budget and, and all those kind of things and experience and the desire to do something. So I love things like... Uh, you know, you know those uh, stop motion animations that were made for the Tsar. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the the insect adultery one. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and you think that's just amazing. But for some reason, I mean, Ardman seemed new because it because stop motion has never been an American thing. There's yeah. very little American stop motion. I don't know why. Mm. It, I suppose Disney. Who I mean, if if Disney had never existed, yeah. I would not have told mine. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think the splendors of Pixar makes up for the horrors of Disney. That's a, it's a, bold, it's a bold claim, but no, it's true, isn't it? I mean, yeah, because I, I spent a bit of time with Ray Harryhausen, and he obviously ended up Did here. You? Yeah, you? when I ran a film festival, um, and he ended up here because of the lack of opportunities and the lack of taking it seriously in the states. Um, but his sequences were famous. Yeah, but never. It was yeah, kind of always seen as in the B. You know that apart from kind of King Kong. Um, you know, which he didn't work. He kind of didn't work on. He worked with um, Willis O'Brien and he on Mighty Joe Young. But that was that was serious. But then everything else after was kind of taken as B in terms of the, the kind of things that he was able to do. But they never saw it as a craft that they you, you could you could do at a bigger scale. I think that was if you invested in it because it was always seen in B pictures or um, you know and kind of oh yeah that's really nice. But never so he was kind of frustrated. I think. And maybe it's such an unlikely career trajectory from special <laughs> effects person to director, but uh, yeah. you know we know the Lord of the Rings shows that. You know Peter Jackson went that route. Yeah, uh, and others. There are, other, there are uh, others that. Well, Del Toro. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Who yeah. you mentioned in, in the in the book? Um, so yeah, uh, about the book. Uh, thanks for uh, yeah coming on the podcast. Um, in my own home, no trouble. Your, yeah, well, it's it's lovely to be in the in the den of, of knowledge. Uh, yes, that's that what they say. Um, I guess we'll just start with why collect your criticism. Oh, well, because uh, a publisher expressed an interest. Uh, I'd always been told it's a non-starter. It used to be that you could get collections of criticism published, but you could. I mean, there was a time you could get sermons published. I mean, there used to be anything you could get any published essay essays. I got had a public uh, a book of essays published in 1997, barely sold a bit. But I thought it was really interesting. You cannot sell essays, and this is the closest you can get. But I thought I wanted to do a bit of a of a run through. I, I wanted to 
do some second thoughts as well as just reprinting stuff and yeah. talk about the way subsequent films have changed my mind about things or haven't. And I'm not a great one for changing my mind. I always think I'm going to change my mind. Never do. Do you find that when you see a film that you've seen before for about half an hour, you think, oh, I didn't, re- I didn't remember that. And maybe it's not as I thought. And then by the end, you think, no, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, I did, I, did that, I did that recently with, um, well, a film I, I, I watched recently and just completely forgotten about it until the last 20 minutes. Ah. It was The Heroes of Telemark, the Anthony Mann that popped up on the iPlayer. And I was like, oh, Kirk Douglas and Richard Harris, you know, Danish kind of war movie. I'll watch. And then I was like, this is okay. And then kind of enjoying it. And then it got to, I'm sure, and then literally I remembered I'd seen this for like six months ago. And it completely. Six months. Yeah. And it's, it's so, and it's Anthony Mann, but it kind of lacks most of the stuff that makes him. Interesting. It was a really strange experience, but I, I generally don't, I don't change my opinion in the positive way, and I don't necessarily kind of go back and go, oh, I hate that now. But I can definitely see where I've, I saw things under a certain influence of age yeah. or nostalgia, where I'm like, yeah, I, I that was coloured by certain things that are not necessarily critical. But are you coloured by what you've read about a film before you see no. it? No. Well, because you don't read it, or because you're immune? I don't read it. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the great things about being a film critic, it's by and large you're there first. But yeah. one of the things I, I was embarrassed by my review of Blue Velvet, partly because I had to do it with Raising Arizona, I think, in a, in a two-headed mm. review in the same week. But it seemed to me that I was too much under the spell of Pauline Kael's very powerful mm. review of Blue Velvet, which was odd because it started with a quote. I, mean, I remember the New Yorker review started, uh, call me crazy, but I want to see this film again, end yeah. quote. So she quoted somebody else's reaction to the film, before she gave you hers, which is odd, because as a critic, I don't like it when somebody says, my wife turned to me and said, mm. I, I don't like those personalised criticisms, and I felt Pauline Kael didn't need to defend herself by saying, I may be the only person in the world who loves this movie, but I don't care, because yeah. that was rather her thing. But seeing it 30 years later, uh, I felt I got more out of it, partly because there were a couple of documentaries that were fed into it, which were really interesting about things like production value, mm. that... Because he had so little money, he took so much care with the lighting and the position of the cameras and so on. And Blue Velvet looks so good now. Yeah. It really uh, it really does. It's yeah. And it's interesting is that you're kind of talking there about other critics, because um, one of the things that I really you know, found interesting about the book was when you're talking about critics in the room. You know, and because I, you know, I was a regional critic for, for a number of years, so I would kind of gather three or four times a year with the regional critics and the experience of being in a room with critics was was always surprising in the way that you talk about in the sense that uh, there's no laughter at comedies and there's no there's no kind of sense of tension at horror everyone's trying to push down to try and you know not not show their hand which I just find really fascinating I laugh all the time I've got a sort of dirty laugh which <laughs> only in movies you know I wouldn't think of it somehow it licenses you to express something uh, private you know something that's personal but the that flows into the group. Mm. Even watching Parasite the other day, uh, you know, I could hear myself laughing, not in a self-conscious way, but just very empowered by the by the delightful film. Yeah. Well, delightful, not quite the word, but it's quite dark in its way. But how well I was being manipulated, and how at the same time I was being left free to have my own reactions to individual moments. I like it when you don't quite know what you're supposed to think. Yeah, you know, I love. It. I think I mentioned in the book that I, I was. Uh, at a public showing, I was reviewing it, but I was happened to be in, in States and watching, I think it was in Washington, watching the Cronenberg Naked Lunch. Yeah. And it doesn't tell you. I mean, there's the scene early on where the hero, played by Peter Weller, has lost his job as an exterminator, comes home, and the first thing he sees is his wife, Judy Davis, shooting up in the breast. And he does not react at all. He just talks as if he wants to... You know, decompress after a day's work. It's only afterwards we discover she's been shooting up on bug spray, and that's why he's lost his job because she's taken off the poison <laughs> to, to, to be a, a bug spray junkie, and there's nothing left to kill the bugs. And then a little bit later, at a bar, he talks to a mugwump, which is an enormous uh, bug, which is drinking at the next place from him. And the the way you move from one ridiculous setup to another without being cued in as to how you're supposed to feel, I find really liberating. Mm. But I know that an awful lot of film viewers don't. They want to see a sequel. They want to see something that they know what they're going to get. Yeah. They feel really betrayed if something new comes along. I think, I'm not a good party. If I want to. Yeah. And it, it's interesting when critics do that because a, a lot of the kind of charges made against critics now is that, oh, you're not fans. You know, like, you know, we the fans know Star Wars. We the fans know 
you know, all these blockbusters and you're a critic, you're not a fan. And it's interesting because I think a lot of critics would say, well, yeah, we are fans. But some of the practices of critics are not necessarily the same as fans. And it's interesting that that's... But, but also fans is such a market-driven base. Yeah. It really is. I mean, there's a friend of mine living in France who felt really cheated that French people got to see the new Star Wars before he saw the version anglaise because it was a rite of passage for him because it was some, you know, one of the first things he saw as a kid. Movies don't work that way to me. And as it happens, I saw the first... I, I saw... THX 1138, the first George Lucas film, really liked it. Uh, saw American Graffiti, liked it, but thought it was very much had an eye on the market. And then saw Star Wars and thought, this is so much not my thing. It just seems so mechanical. Mm. And this sort of myth broth that he creates. Uh, really, really. But it meant I, I was on tune when they got me to review, was it The Phantom Menace that has Jar Jar Binks? Yeah. I mean, without being prompted the existence of Jar Jar Binks in something that has been so thoroughly combed through and uh, blandized and had anything that could possibly be controversial combed out of it, to find that rank stereotype there was just extraordinary. Yeah. But I'm honest, that I also don't like the idea of somebody living in California in a sort of ecotopia who makes films that have no sense of what a world needs to keep itself alive. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that does bother me a bit. Yeah, that's completely absent. Um, and that kind of goes to a, a lovely co- a quote that you say, um, I'm going to quote verbatim just because I really like, um, an ability to respond to strangeness, you know, might be dying out. And that's kind of what you're sort of talking about there, you know, um, that Lynch and subsequent to Blue Velvet has explored kind of to greater, greater depths, I would say. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, he's he's lost me a bit, but he's not he's not following anybody else. So. No, and also, I mean, I, I was surprised to realise, I think, triggered by Dennis Hopper's comments in the documentary about the making of Blue Velvet, that he doesn't watch movies. Mm. Lynch is not uh, he is not a fan. He's only interested in his own private imagery, and that gives an enormous strength. Malik is slightly. I don't think Malik is a film watcher. Do you? Do you think no, he, not I think, at all. I don't think he's. But almost all that generation was. Yeah. They were all absolutely saturated. In, you know, when you hear Scorsese talking about the moment he noticed that, the, uh, that when you started a Powell Pressburger film, the, the archers, do you, do you remember yeah. this detail? Yeah. It, it, it always starts with a, a target and arrows striking it. And he noticed that it was shot freshly each time. The ident was not the same. And you know, if you think that, that sort of set of eyes on a teenager yeah. is, is wonderful, but that immersion, which I find uns- you know, unsatisfactory in Scorsese, the sense that without realising it, he's endlessly getting feedback loops on cinematic material and there is actually no life in it at all, no, no original yeah. experience in it. I don't have that feeling with, with Lynch tonight because clearly it is his own life experience that he's processing. Alex, a more puzzling one. Yeah, I think, you know, you kind of drawn it, I think, in terms of uh, his kind of philos- his interest in philosophy and his background as a philosopher you know, and a kind of, you know, scholar of philosophy. And when I did my doctorate, I looked at the educational backgrounds of filmmakers. And Lynch is a fine art student who then later studied film. But studied film as a way to basically make moving image fine art. He um, also moved to L.A. so as to make a razor head. And yeah. you couldn't have a bleaker, colder film to make in a warm, supportive place. Yeah. That's just extraordinary. But Malik, I think, Malik, there is no intellectual content mm. in Malik's film. Pure feeling. Um, or like you know, a, a, a kind of search for something that he wants to feel. Or... Sublimity, transcendence, mm. Mm. Uh, imminence to give it a, a, a posh word. I mean, the last film I really loved was uh, The Thin Red Line, but that's partly because it was my first appearance on a combative old show called <laughs> Late Review, where you were live and had to react uh, with what was not necessarily a sympathetic audience. And I'd not been on it before there turned out there were various personality reasons why I'd not been asked before but finally the BBC had no choice in effect because uh, somebody who was supposed to see the movie New York missed his flight and so they had to find somebody who'd seen the thin red line who'd read the John le Carre book and could see the other things and this was Wednesday and it went out live on Thursday evening so really I was pretty much the only one who could do it but I was surprised to find the other critics were very closed against The Thin Red Line because it wasn't an obvious war movie. Yeah. You could take the war out of that movie and still have a lot of movie. 
and that's what was interesting to me. Whereas normally with war films, you know, there's war and there's, okay, let's maybe have a little bit of love, love interest or a flashback or something. And I loved how decentered it was, mm. that it didn't privilege combat as the expression of how a man realises himself. And that is so unusual. Yeah. I, I love it for that. Yeah, me too. Um, is that what you're, it's, it's something you like? You like that? Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's maybe my favourite Malik for, for, for those kind of reasons. It definitely it, it feels connected to... Well, his his interest in kind of film genre, to the to a very limited point, uh, but but how he places his own kind of desires to explore within that, um, that later just become desires to explore, which I, I I find kind of interesting here and there, but but as a whole, there's something about the Thin Red Line which does feel like like a really profound exploration yeah. of something. Um, it it feels like yeah, kind of the apex of what he's was trying to do before and afterwards. I think um, the the Kubrick thing. Okay, which Kubrick thing? The th- it did, um, it's really, it was really fascinating to just see you kind of constantly kind of drawing back on Kubrick, both in review but also in the sections of the book that kind of that link uh, that link all the pieces. It's partly because two thousand and one, which was sort of stunningly impressive and also incomprehensible at the time, has grown. I don't like it any more than I did, but it yeah. doesn't offer itself up for liking. But the immaculate rendering of objects and space you know, the, the clinical grandeur the withheld misanthropy do really work strongly but I, I, he is a perverse mm. uh, filmmaker uh, I didn't reprint my review of wide, 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 Eyes Wide Shut but that I thought was I was going to ask yeah because there's no reviews in the book it's just your no j- just sort of well I, I think that just so happens I mean I didn't like um, the Vietnam film uh, Full Metal Jacket I mean, it felt like a fantastic uh, tour de force opening segment and then lowering tension and it seems quite forced, cynical tone in there. Uh, so it, it happened, that, but I did review Eyes Wide Shut and the thing that fascinated me about that was it was a film about jealousy. I mean, it, it occurred to me sometime while I was watching it, trying to keep, because he uses blue and red a lot in the film as if he's using them against the way they're normally used. So he uses red in scenes of withheld feeling and coolness and blue in scenes of expressive uh, passion, which is exactly the opposite of the conventional way of using it. And I thought he was saying, I'm Kubrick, I can reverse (laughs) the laws of colour and film and make it work. And he sort of does. And he also has made a film about jealousy in which the colour green, as far as I can tell, does not appear. And again, that seemed like exactly the sort of cubic thing to do. Even the music. Uh, there's a bit of music uh, which uh, plays very few notes. There's a note on the piano hammering away in a scene of suspense. I don't know if it's the audio or something. And then there's another note high up. And if you're into that sort of music, you know that it's by a composer called Ligeti, who he used in 2001 without asking permission, uh, which was okay because he used short enough excerpts. He only had to ask permission from the publisher, not from the composer. But it meant Ligeti, fascinating composer, went to this hot new film and found there were bits of his own music in it, which must have been a very weird shock. But the fact that he goes back to the music uh, that he sort of slightly felt and makes this incredibly rigorous piece, which has only two notes... Mm -hmm and encloses it in Kubrick world. I mean, that's what's so clever. Mm. Uh, and also coldly megalomaniacal about Kubrick is he can say, I will swallow Richard Strauss. <laughs> I will swallow this enormous cue and make it mine so you will never hear it without seeing the images I've yeah. done with it. I will take the Blue Danube, which could not be schlockier and more mainstream, and I will give you and sear into your mind images of space. And... The fact that he gives the music, the music runs in full. But I think there's the, the Blue Danube is seven minutes, something like that. He runs it all. Uh, so he's not even cheating by cutting the music up. He's saying, I can overwhelm this music with my images. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so he's, he's a fascinating case. Uh, but <laughs> I wouldn't want to watch, you know, I wouldn't watch, wouldn't, wouldn't watch, want to watch this for a whole weekend of his film. No, but it's interesting to read you kind of go through so many different 
types and forms of cinema and areas of cinema, and to, but but kind of have this point of almost orbit. You know, he kind of feels like he's at the centre at least of of this collection. Okay. And I want to talk a little bit what, about Kubrick. Yeah, more than Altman because I do sort of Altman later. Altman out. later on, yeah. yeah. But but de- it, there's definitely a, I'd kind of note all Kubrick's again. Here's Stanley oh. again. You know, and The Shining comes up a couple of times as well. And then you know Altman later on. It it was more about yeah these these figures that you know kind of just have impacted your film watching in such a way that they're always kind of present. It's part- Even if they're not interesting or you don't like them, it's not about being a fan. It's about knowing that there's there's someone out there who can do that. And it, it, you could say it is overwhelming and it is, you know, and, and they seem like the figures for you in, in the kind of field of cinema that, that have that attraction. At, at the same time, I can, I, I'm not somebody who enjoys Barry Lyndon. Mm. Uh, I know there are people like Scorsese who think it's absolutely fantastic, who think the ending, the last sequence is one of the most devastating things in cinema. It just doesn't reach me at all. And Ryan O'Neill is so underpowered. Uh, you know, just you, when you've had your film stolen by Norman Rossiter, you should, you know, you could, you should recast in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems that all that money, all that effort, mm. but you've got this bit of pizza dough that I'm supposed to take as my representative on, on screen. It's not that Randy Neal is a bad actor, but yeah. he's wrong there or he's not being encouraged to find anything in himself. It, it may have to do with history, that the, the film that you not exactly grew up with, but the films that made a huge impact on you that impact can't quite be recreated. You know, I was thinking of, there was a um, was it Life Cinematic, and there was an absolute rave, I think it was Edgar Wright, for Mad Max Fury Road. And I thought it was admirable. I, mean, I, I really enjoyed it. It was absolute kinetic excitement. But the extra gold standard that it seemed to set for him wasn't available to me because I'd already given that prize to Mad Max 2. You know, having seen yeah, yeah. The Road Warrior, which was complex, ugly, nasty, and not always involving the huge leap that was Mad Max 2. Uh, you know, that carnival of violence mm. with the very black humorous uh, elements in it, I thought was so successful that as if I've played my Joker on that movie as something that is a benchmark of its genre and I have nothing left to give for Fury Road. Simply, I thought that the Blade Runner sequel was unfairly treated. I thought there was... I didn't review it, but I thought it was much better than people seemed to think. You know, the reboot. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, we, we talked about it on the podcast. Um, and, uh, yeah, it kind of came to... it. Half of it was astonishing, you know, and, I could, and it felt like watching a filmmaker be, being pulled in different directions by his producer, Ridley Scott, um, and, uh, and kind of not knowing how to handle some of the politics. But, but on the whole, really striving for something... Which I sort of sensed in Arrival, which is, you know, a kind of distinctive voice, and some of the some of the some of the feeling in that was really extraordinary. I thought yeah. the scene where the hologram he has sex with the prostitute, wanting to have sex with the hologram, uh, was terribly affecting. I mean, the moment you want to describe it like that, I, I feel like a total perv through describing those terms. But the fact you know the people on screen are not real; mm. uh, they are all holograms or some holograms. Yeah. They don't even have the convincingness of holograms. But the sense of his need for her, for this non-existent creature to be part of his world, I did find really touching yeah. in an unexpected way. And the fact that he was so well managed, and you also felt very sharply the resentment and humiliation of the human body that is made to carry this emotional freight. But you also thought, what is the history of Hollywood? Yeah. But women's bodies being forced to carry an awful lot of emotional freight. So I thought that the resonance of all that that it was quite simple in a way. It was a simple expression of longing, yeah. but it was had a lot of resonance. Yeah. That, that worked for me. It, without that sequence, mm. I might not have felt so strongly about the whole thing. Yeah, I think, and I th- what I think is, uh, yeah, what, what's great is be able to talk about a film that came out two years ago, because most of the time you don't get the chance to. Yeah, because you know, we're kind of moving moving on to the next big thing. So, how many films do you see a week? Uh, I watch a lot for different. You know, I probably watch about six or seven a week at home. Um, for, for various, I, I, for various I love the fact when I was reviewing for The Independent, I only had to see one or two a week. Yes, yeah, that, that, I don't watch kind of new releases. I'm not, re- we're, not oh. re- we're not reviewing anything on the podcast that's new. Um, so that's just... So you, you, you follow a trail, you research something, you go through a, a sort of game of, of stepping stones into from one thing to another? Kind of, yeah. So, yeah, I just, I just wrote a couple of pieces on uh, Nicholas Winding Reference archive project. So spent a lot of time watching these free films that he's released online that he bought from this library, 
And what that's... about which I know nothing? Uh, well, you can read my okay. pieces. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Send me the link uh, if you don't mind. I will do. Yeah, but it, but yeah. It, so it's kind of and and teaching and kind of screenwriting and and the stuff of the podcast. I'm in a very fortunate position that what we do uh, what we do on the podcast is kind of talk about what we like. So what I watch is is a whole range of stuff, and I I'm always fighting that that urge to be present and current. And I try and stay up to date as much as possible. And we'll always see everything eventually, but I'm in no rush, um, which is I, in a I nice position a mistake, to be. I, I think a critic is not meant to be an expert. And you do talk about that as well. And it, which with is really books too. Yeah. I, I tr- because the expert is always one who says, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's very defended. Mm. You're defending your territory. It's very territorial. And I'd much rather commit myself and be wrong than hedge my bets and not say very much. Uh, and I mean, after all, I did write a book about a Japanese film without knowing a whole lot about a single film that I hadn't seen till 2008, and the book was out in 2011. And it's from a position of not artificial but real ignorance. In other words, I don't want to research Japanese culture to see what Ozu meant in late spring. I want to look at what's on screen mm. and how it works because there is a lot that's very surprising just in the text. And you know, I'll then follow some leads if need be. But it was one bit of dialogue in that film that got me going. It was the first time I saw it, sitting here with my partner. We put it on, and there was a bit of dialogue. And I remember stopping the, the DVD and saying, did you hear that bit of dialogue? And we went back to it. The, the plot of Late Spring, 1949, made by this director who's supposed to be so zen, it, it's, you know, it could cut you into shreds. Uh, it is so zen. But it's about a woman of 28, I think, who is unmarried, looking after her widowed father. And because he feels it's not fair for her not to be married, that she's sacrificing a chance to look after him, he pretends he's getting married so that she accepts a proposal that she's been made. But you never see the man she marries. She goes to her wedding as if it was her funeral. And at the end of the film, the old man, now on his own, peels, at first I thought it was an apple, but Japanese pears have the same shape as an apple. He peels it with a knife in a single movement so you get the whole rind and the rind falls to the floor and there's a shot of the sea and it ends. And clearly he's made himself desolate in the interests of his daughter who he loves. But the bit of dialogue early on is a bit where a visitor to the house says, uh, is it, has explained, oh, she's just back from the hospital. Yeah, uh, you know, her, her tests are back to normal now. Um, but it was the forced labour labor in the Navy in the war that has ruined her health. And I think the book this is based on is pre-war. So the one thing you know for sure is that the director has added that. Mm. So why has he, why he added that? Why has he brought this detail in? And as I sort of follow the thread, there's a lot going on in the film, and a lot of it is to do with censorship, which you never hear about. The Japanese film production in 1949 was entirely controlled by, by Americans, who, first of all, had to approve your outline, then your script, then the finished shot film. So there were three stages at which you could lose all your efforts. The worst being the last, because you'd spent all that money, and it could just be shelved. <clears throat> uh, but you weren't allowed to show any Americans, at a time when there were a third of a million of them in Japan. You weren't allowed to make a period film with that special permission. For fear, you would make something glorifying fascism. And you weren't allowed to do that under the democratic rules that had been imposed on a society which had not had democracy before. So just to see how he's working, not because he thinks that the family, the truth, the family life are the only truths, but the only thing he's allowed to do, really, realistically, if he's not going to do anything on location or very little, is to have everything indoors. And to suggest that this woman is sexually traumatised, mm. and that's why she doesn't want to get married, is because she has high status as yeah. the dutiful daughter and this is being chipped away by her father. Her father destroys her uh, peace of mind so as to preserve her happiness. So it becomes much richer when you unpack things. But the things about, uh, about censorship are really fascinating again because I didn't start with them. Mm. And there's a, a book by somebody who happens to be able to read Japanese, which most commentators on Japanese film, even when they speak Japanese, can't read it. So who's looked at the original scripts and seen what has been changed. And he's enough aware of what's going on. There's a moment in the film where the characters are on a train going to Tokyo and the camera keeps looking out the window at the carriage up ahead as it goes around a corner and you can see a little bit of the side of the carriage. But he has worked out, and this is a book that 300 copies were printed, 
So it's, it's worth getting the word out yeah. that the white stripe along that carriage means American personnel only. And that carriage is more or less empty. The carriage the Japanese characters are in is absolutely full. So that's, that's not yeah, yeah. nothing. That's, the film is not about nothing. It's yeah, not yeah, about yeah. family life. And when they finally arrive in Tokyo, there's a double shot of a particular building. Uh, in other words, from one side and then another. And you can read academic articles that say, well, this is like somebody arriving in London and two shots of Big Ben from different sides. It's, it's parodying the idea of the establishing shot. No, if it happens that that building was where the PX was, in other words, the, the military canteen, uh, where uh, soldiers came to get their money and so on, and in real life, as the first audience of that film would absolutely have known, it would have been crowded with pimps, black marketeers, and American servicemen who couldn't show. So he must have got up at about five in the morning to show the street level shot. And then later, uh, in the next shot is of higher up in the building, and what he is showing you is the censorship office to which he had to bring the outline, the script, and submit the final film. So once you look at it, it's really rich. But if you think you know what a film is about, mm. You're, you're lost somehow. And, and that's, that's the trouble with the reviews that tell you, oh, it's a typical such and such. Yeah. You may not see what's there. Yeah, and you're kind of approaching it in terms of like the, the text, but being open to what you're going to get from it rather than going in with a preconceived context of Ozu as a filmmaker yeah. and what he's interested in and looking for what you've been told actually taking it on its merit I mean that was a fascinating thing to listen to just you know that, okay. you know, that uh, okay. no it's great you know because it's it's, it's um, and it's kind of it, it was what was so refreshing about the book as well was kind of seeing a collection of criticism and and that kind of voice across you know a period of work um, do you have prejudices about one genre over another are there things that genres that make your heart leap and others that make you think oh dear kind of changed as I've got older oh okay. yeah what's you know. changed um, well I think you know a, a lot of my a lot of my, my formative influences were the obvious ones, you know, Scorsese, uh, the Coen brothers, um, who I still, you know, really enjoy a lot of their films, but but kind of going to university to study film and then and then kind of teaching film has kind of moved me in different directions um, to a, a quieter, you know, slower. So Tsai Ming Ling is one of my favourite filmmakers. Um, you named me uh, Tai Taiwanese filmmaker. Um, and, and and Ozu, I've, I've kind of only discovered in, in the last couple of years, he was a, a, a gap, as they say, um, and a kind of fascinating. Yeah, so, so to the point now where, yeah, I'm kind of not, I, I'm not interested in the stuff I was interested in before, um, which I think is, it feels kind of good, but it's quite isolating, I think, in terms of when you're in a social sense of when you're trying to talk to people who are still want to talk about the old, the old stuff, and then you know everyone hated the Irishman, and I was like, actually, I, I enjoyed it um, uh, because it was interesting when you sort of saying about Scorsese's uh, feedback loop, which is present, and he's kind of talking to himself, not even other films for so much of that film. But towards the end, it felt like he was actually going, which is why I quite enjoyed Silence as well. Not enjoyed it because it's the wrong word, but but sense that it was he was actually trying to trying to talk about something else to himself in his mm. films. Mm. Um, but no one, no one saw Silence, and, and and you know, and I was lucky enough to catch The Irishman in a cinema, one of the rare, where that kind of the ending, the last kind of thirty minutes, was really powerful. Yeah, it is really powerful. But you start thinking, what's that got to do with the gangster movie? Mm. Uh, because maybe it's maybe it's it's just saying you know, of, of the violent deaths which are flagged up, flagged up throughout the film, where you have somebody appearing, and is there a freeze frame yeah. and a title? Uh, so that you automatically know how long somebody has to uh, to live and so forth, uh, and the fact that the hero, the Rob Nero character, doesn't have that. You know, mm. he has a death by inches. Yeah. And to understand that fantasy violence is much more uh, desire. You know, even checking out violently is better than what most of us are supposed to hope for. Yeah. Uh, and I was I was thinking that. Uh, I think in the first, the, there are movie marquees shown in the film. The first one I think is, is, is it All About Eve or something? Uh, and the last one is The Shootist. And The Shootist is exactly about somebody who, with a terminal illness, goes out in a blaze of glory or tries to make it happen mm. simply for that reason. You know, you keep your legend, you're not whittled away yeah. by life bit by bit. But that last 20 minutes, I did think it was extremely powerful, but it did not belong with the film that we'd seen the first three hours of. See, it was interesting, because I thought that it... it I, I read the first the first section as, as kind of Scorsese reckoning with... not Because everyone said it's about his career, but I, I thought it was more about the 
how his career had been perceived and this idea of him as a kind of gangster filmmaker, which I think is a lot of his big hit as a gangster movies, but but it, it doesn't make up a huge percentage of the films he's actually made, kind of gangster movies. Um, mm-hmm. Mean Streets. Quite a few. Yeah, Goodfellas. Mean Streets, mean Streets Goodfellas, Goodfellas Casino, Casino, and The Irishman. Yeah, okay. Well, my favourite ones of his, uh, I mean, I saw Mean Streets when it came out, really liked it. But I also loved uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I love After Hours. Yeah, After me too. Hours is a fantastic yeah. film. But it, it, that isn't a film that he is hugely invested in, I think, as, mm. a, as a thinker. But it brings the best out of his technique, that deadly lightness yeah. of a lot of that. Because it was made in a hurry, I think, when other projects were stored. I think so, yeah. Well, yeah, Last Temptation of Christ, which took and years. I, I think the films that he puts his marrow into end up not being very interesting. Mm. I mean, Last Temptation of Christ, it's not a failure, it's not a disaster... But there are only, uh, and it's coming up with new ideas even towards the end. I mean, we see Christ crucified sitting sideways. You think, like, what? But I've never seen that in yeah. any representation of a crucifixion before. Uh, and similarly with, uh, with Silence, mm. uh, another much brooded over project. I think maybe brooding isn't his strong suit. Yeah, I think maybe, yeah. maybe going in on the sly. Uh, and even those last minute things like, uh, I mean, when I was reviewing The Irishman, I... Because it starts with a uh, a long take, uh, I looked up the the long take in Goodfellas, which I remember being so amazing. And did you read the the stuff online about how it was done? No. Is that the cameraman said this is so fantastic the light in the kitchen we have to go around the kitchen so they go down the stairs and all the way around the kitchen and back to where they were. So as a journey, it makes, makes no sense. sense at all. But it's brilliant. But the other thing is, but they had to have. The danger was, because the camera was handheld and right behind them, if they got to the bottom and turned, the camera would lose sight of them, it, even if it was only for a second. So they had to have bits of business for him at the bottom of the stairs every time there was a change of direction. And that's how they got the idea of him tipping people so lavishly. They needed to have you know, a, a micro MacGuffin yeah. for uh, something to motivate him to stop still so that the camera could catch up. And just the sense that... He's improvising that technical innovations are, uh, are sort of cascading into new ideas, mm. which I don't get with Kubrick. No. You know, I, th- I think the, uh, the, the candlelight in when he discovered how much he could do with candlelight in Barry Lyndon, it didn't push him to anything except making things very slow. <laughs> the only exception being that it was Malcolm McDowell who started singing Singing in the Rain. Did you know this? Yes, uh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. And Kubrick cleared the rights that day. So Mr. Brood over everything said, you know, make the call. Because for once, somebody yeah. had made a contribution. What did Mc- McDowell get out of it? As far as I can make out ruined eyes. Aren't, yeah. aren't his eyes more or less ruined <laughs> through, so, yeah. through being... <laughs> yeah, prized open. Um, oh, there's so oh, much to sorry. talk about. No, that's great. Um, uh, you mentioned there about uh, Ligeti. Let's go back to that. Because one of the things that, you know, it's, it's kind of... In, 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 in a lot of the pieces is is your kind of interest in music but there's 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 do, you, I don't know if this is a, a fair sense but you get the sense that you would like to have talked about classical music in film more uh, no it, it's just that I think music in film it is like a suicide pack film and music are dragging themselves down together yeah. because the overuse of film particularly when it's telling you what you already know I mean there was, there was one week where I think for the TLS I covered um, Whiplash and Fox Hunter and Fox Hunter was Fox re- Catcher sorry. Fox yeah, Catcher yeah, yeah. Fox Catcher was I thought a really interesting film because they the, there's a scene early on where the two brothers wrestle and in most films they would just do a hold here or there I mean they would be trained to do just enough for a couple of seconds it would be edited together and there'd be music emphasising the tension whereas it was done with Mark Ruffalo and Channing Tatum uh, really wrestling, or certainly the camera stays on them for a long time, and you see everything in their relationship, and it holds off on the music. There was very little music just towards the end, the last half hour there were bits of music, which was, I thought, a mistake. Maybe you can't finish a, a film without music, although I think the Coen brothers managed it with No Country for Old Men. There's virtually no music yeah. in the whole thing. And there's a wonderful moment in that where... 
there's a mariachi band and you think, oh, right, you, you're giving a soundtrack now. And then you realise the hero, Jeff Brolin, has just opened his eyes after being knocked out or drinking himself uh, unconscious. And the mariachis are leaning over him because he's, oh, he's the only person still around who might conceivably pay them. And that's the right approach to music. I am sympathetic to the sort of Dogma 91 idea mm. that the music should be what the characters hear rather than what you want. Uh, mm. what, what you, you know, I think they call it diegetic music when it's done like yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I prefer that than something that is uh, that is laid on. But what's laid on can work really well as long as it's not there the whole time. As long as it's not dialogue with silence. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, and it's not kind of assuming that you're not going to get the emotion from the mm. the picture and the action. Uh, there's a good piece in this month's Science Sound about Hong Sang Soo's use mm. and non well, non use of music, and why he might love music so much that he doesn't want to use it in his films, mm. which is really mm. really interesting. Um, so that was just something I picked up on because it's th- when you talk about classical music, there's a clear love. I, I love about, it, but yeah. I, I also love. I mean, the the use of Street Fighting Man and Mean Streets mm. was fantastically good, uh, with the slow motion in the bar and just bits of observation. That's the bit where the insult is mook, as far mm. as I remember. In the pool, uh, in the pool hall. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And and the character who's been insulted knows that it fits the genre of insult, but doesn't know what it's meant. And says, "What's a mook?" <laughs> it's as if you're not playing fair. You have to insult me in recognised ways. Everything about that, the drive of the music, the pulling back, the, the, the holding back of explosion yeah. of, of uh, masculine violence with the slow motion and those bits of dialogue, the suggestion that there's a ritual going on, I found that extremely rich. And you know, doing that with a bit of hiding would not have worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think, <clears throat> and again, there is, uh, do I, me- I think I mentioned Lars von Trier using uh, bits of Wagner in Melancholia yeah, yeah. and doing this, the Spielberg, tr- uh, the Kubrick trick of saying I will make this mine you know, ne- however many times you've heard it before you will remember the planet's death yeah. with, uh, with the Libra's you know, I, I like it when people understand that music is a totality already yeah. and you can't just clip one totality onto another and say okay all the virtue of this is going to transfuse into that you have to be much cleverer and I think a lot of people aren't they use, I, I like it when music is mixed a little back. I remember just, even on a film that is not a brilliant film, I think it's an Alan Rudolph film called Mortal Thoughts. Mm. Bruce uh, Willis and Demi Moore. Bruce yeah. Demi Moore. Yeah. Uh, and then Headley, I think. Uh, the music is by Mark Isham, and I thought, I hope this guy gets a lot of work. He's a jazz trumpeter. So is, 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 his, the style of the music is not particularly the go-to thing, yeah, yeah. because an awful lot of stuff is dilute classical minimalism. Uh, but I thought it worked really well, and it, it never overpowered a sequence, it always supported it, but often what it supported was the non-obvious mm. feelings. Uh, and somebody, I think it's is it somebody called Bear, Bear McCreary, I think, wrote the music for Battle Star Galactica, the, you know, the, the remake, you know, the, the TV, the show, yeah. the TV yeah. series. And uh, there, on one of the DVDs, he talked about how he scored, and he said, I don't score the utmost feeling, I score the lower one. And the example he gave is when the president of the world or the galaxy, or whatever it is, who was originally a, a, a teacher, but has, has survived and is now in charge of the few remnants of humanity that there are. And she's had cancer and she's been on a drug that suppressed the symptoms, uh, but also destroyed her decision, decision-making ability and generally made her feel a bit mm. uh, out of thing. So she comes off the drugs and you see her jogging around the very... It's, it's rather like the... the Running, uh, Care Dilly is uh, running in uh, in 2001, except that there's much more space to cover, but the music is ominous. So everything you see is high fives and happiness, but the music is, is has some yeah. dread in it. But then you're talking to somebody when, when my partner and I were deciding what music we were going to have for our civil ceremony. And you can bring along a CD, uh, and we have very convergent taste in music, and we like lots of somewhat obscure classical stuff. So we put stuff on. We put on a Czech composer called Martinu, who we liked very much. Didn't work. And we put on a, an Armenian-American-Scottish composer called Hofhanes. And it didn't work because the things that were beautiful smelled of lilies and death. You know, that if, if something was too beautiful, 
it it was not right for a yeah. for a commitment. And then my partner put on a CD of Esa Pekka Salonen conducting Bernd Herrmann and said, why not this? And it was the stabbing music from Psycho, which we did not go okay. with. But we went for the main title theme from Taxi Driver. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, which is lush but ominous. Yeah. You know, nobody could say that is, is a light-hearted thing, but it felt right. Mm. This, this lush, beautifully upholstered, slightly uneasy cue. Yeah. So my brother Bernard on the CD played many times. Uh, and uh, my partner's family said, what's that terrible music we thought? Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Perfect. What, what would you choose? Uh, well, uh, uh, the first time we chose uh, Sam Cooke, Change Is Gonna Come, um, which, yeah, so that was the first time. Uh, well, which, you could say that there's a bit of... It was a change. Yeah. Uh, not the change I was expecting at the time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but then, and then, yeah, I'm remarried now, and uh, we had... Yeah, we didn't have a first dance, I don't think. But we did, we had um, MIA and uh, Björk, I think, for the... No, we didn't have Björk, Björk was the first one. MIA was, I think, what we came down the uh, the aisle to, um, which my... Um, <laughs> Missing an action. Yeah. <laughs> so what that, was the Björk? The Björk? the Björk was from the first wedding, so I'm sure we shouldn't mention that. Uh, okay. not, not that my new wife listens to the podcast anyway. <laughs> um, but that was, um, she does a cover on her first album. Um, not so quiet, no. No, no. I can't remember. Oh, okay. Long time ago, but yes, um, it's a it's an important choice to make to try and hit the hit the right tone. And I think yeah, the the non obvious is is always interesting. I mean, I used to DJ, uh, used to DJ weddings and I used to film weddings as well. It was always interesting to see what people would choose, and the the, the less obvious choices always seem to fit better in terms of you know that you say the commitment and that these two people kind of know each other um, and are on the same page. And if they're on the same page and everyone else is. Is not that all seemed like a good sign? I used to get a lot of people saying, oh, "Why are you playing this music?" It's like, well, because that's what yeah. that's what they asked for. You know, that it's their day, and you know, and all these close friends and relatives were just like, "Oh, this is awful," but it's like, well, this is this is what these people who yes. you're coming here to celebrate actually. This is what they. This is who they so are. Get with the program, Julia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, time's rattling on. It's great. Um, the one of the things that that came up of, from reading it was the, the sense that there could be a thousand versions of this book. In, yeah, a, in a good way, in the sense that the, the way you write b- between the pieces feels so kind of immediate and instinctive, almost like you're not making up as you go along. But that I love the kind of the, the Wyler Cote, like laying the tracks. You know, this piece. <laughs> That's <laughs> a lovely way of putting it. You know, this piece has inspired me thinking about this piece and that leads to this piece. And, you know, and you've written so much, but, you know, which I think is a, it's such a refreshing way to do it in the sense that it, it feels alive. Which and that you're actually engaged with. Yeah. If, if, if you're, you know, I, I don't know anything. I really don't. And I don't want to write a screenplay. Uh, you know, it's, it's not my thing at all. I like fiction. My fiction is very unfilmic because it's very, it tends to be interior to do with point of view. And absolutely the, the contrast between what's on the inside and what's on the outside, which is something that film finds really hard to do. David Lean said of one sequence in... Uh, what's the name of the film? As the Something Moment... Um, the reckless moment. No, that, that that's an awful one. Oh, his, uh, oh, his one. Which, okay. which one. It's Claude Rains thinking that his wife's been unfaithful uh, because he catches a glance. There's something about picking up the key at the hotel, and there's an innocent explanation. But there's a moment when he thinks that his wife's been unfaithful, and David Lean said, you know, "At last, I managed to photograph thought." And that, well, if it needed Claude Rains, who's a fantastic actor. And your editing scheme at its most precise to get something that any book could give you in in a moment. I mean, it just seemed to show a real weakness in cinema. Yeah. Cinema does not photograph thought. It can photograph feeling or it can make you feel things mm. much more. But I, I, I don't respond to visual art without the element of time. Yeah. In other words, put me in front of something in, a, in an art gallery and I will look for the label to find some brainy context for what's supposed to be saying. I don't know where my eye is supposed to go, literally. I don't know, am I supposed to look in the middle and wake out? Do I read it like a book? I'm, I'm that childlikely unprepared for visual art, whereas my, my partner is absolutely attuned to that. It's only with the before and after of film that I can even remember things. Yeah. Because I used, to do, I used to go on something called The Critics, where you talked about... Uh, a book uh, th- but there was always an art exhibition and I learned from experience I had to have seen the art exhibition that morning for a lunchtime record 
because if I'd seen it a day before, the memory fairies would just have swept those yeah. things away. Say it's not in any deck. It's not his thing. So uh, you know, I would confidently say, well, the one with the blue square, and they'd say, red circle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but once there is the before and after, so it's once there is a narrative context. Mm. I don't mean that there needs to be a narrative as such, but the moment there is a before and after. Mm then the visual makes sense to me. But on a wall, it's sort of... Yeah. In a, I just don't, I don't... Are you attuned to visual art without movies, or is it...? Uh, I, I, I've realised that I end, up, I end up trying to find a cinematic reference point in the art. Like, if it reminds me of a certain film, um, I'm more willing to... I'm more likely to engage... Not more willing, but I'm more, more likely to engage with it. If I, if I feel it conjures a feeling that I've had watching something or... A, a tone or a texture of something, then I'm, I, I just I just connect with it more because again I think it's if it, it I find it much harder, particularly with abstract art, to to, to kind of to, again to locate to locate myself or what I should be doing. Mm. Um, you know, I wonder if cinema is you know you sort of talk about lean there. You know that um, has suffered as you know suffered from the the kind of the 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 need to be literary. The you know the kind of the the, the power that literature had over both the kind of the content of early cinema, but also this idea of it being, you know, uh, a more highbrow medium. Well, I, I hate the idea that a book needs to be turned to do a film. Mm. I, I think almost always you're betraying the book by turning to a film, so it's best to start with something that doesn't work. Uh, one of the most interesting films that I reviewed early on in The Independent was Christine Ezard's version of Little Dorrit, where she made two separate films. Mm. Uh, so she did the narrative instead of uh, sort of alternating it. She took you down two separate narrative paths. That's how I remember it. But she was also totally obsessive about all the uh, the knickers and the garters, and you know this bibler was exactly right for nineteen eighteen forty or whatever it was. And after a while, I thought you need to learn to use the camera and to mm. cut so that you emphasise things as they are necessary as they speak, yeah. rather than just because that is the way people would have lived. But it was still fascinating. And I thought, because she loved the period with a sort of fetishist, mm. completist agenda, it got past the fact that the camera rarely contributed. Yeah. And you do... I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do a review of Parasite at the moment, which I, I really like, but I don't think there's a single moment that the camera is part of it, where the camera says, this is my take on it, where the... But there is one moment. Have you seen the film? I haven't seen it yet. Well worth seeing, but there's a moment in it where it's inside a car. The driver is one of the family of imposters that have inserted themselves into this rich people's home without any real intent except to have an easy life, which they're managing. And the, the boss is in the back, who's very keen on employees not crossing the line. But the line is never spelled out. And there's a moment where the driver just says, uh, <clears throat> you, you love your wife as a statement and the camera whips for some reason it whips from his face to the face in the back conveying that character's shock I mean it, it's odd because the movement of startlement is not on the camera is not on the character's face but performed by the camera yeah. because for a start the driver has crossed the line but also because if he loves his wife but that doesn't mean he's faithful to her yeah. whereas the poor family where you're always you can't get away from each other. They're faithful because there is no place to go to be anything else. Yeah. And that moment where he thought, at last, the camera is alive. The camera is not just recording, however beautifully, a fantastically well-constructed and paced screenplay, because it's a marvellous screenplay. But for once, this is cinematic in a really strong yeah. way rather than a neutral way. Yeah. You do seem interested in moments where, the, you know, not pure cinema, but where, you know, Cinema is doing what only cinema can yeah. or should. Is that fair uh, to say? Yeah. Film language yeah. uh, it can be really... Even in, in unexpected places, there's... <coughs> uh, Anna René went on from making uh, some quite chilly, although sometimes very good films. Uh, there was one I saw recently called The War Is Over, which has a sex scene, with, which is one of the best in history, as far as I'm concerned, with Genevieve Bujold, where you are shown things that are physically impossible. In other words, you know, legs appear where no leg can be, but it gets the sense of what sex feels like mm. rather than what it might look like if you were if you were standing yeah. outside yourself and looking at it. So, getting rid of the terrible sort of visual performance anxiety 
that uh, that cinema has uh, inflicted on us. So that if you've got a paunch, basically, you're not allowed to have sex. So I, I love that. But in the 80s, he started filming melodramas, literally old-fashioned boulevard tragedies. Uh, and there, there's, But there's one bit where the camera goes round a table where people are talking, and the one thing it doesn't show you is the face of the person whose status has suddenly changed. I mean, I can't remember the details, but I thought, wonderful, by not showing us what the theatre audience was being shown. I, I don't mean that it, yeah, yeah. it's filmed as if it was a performance, but by taking that text and refusing the single thing that camera does m most easily, which is showing you an expression of surprise, complexity, all those things, by withholding that, it has made it fully cinematic. Yeah. Because but now we have to really look and get clues from elsewhere mm -hmm. to see what's going on really. So, I mean, it, it takes very little to make something truly cinematic, but I think you, you do sit up and notice when suddenly there is something that, that is incredibly striking and could not have been reached by any other route yeah. or could not happen in any other medium. Yeah. And I love the fact that cinema has triumphed. I mean, it's seen off its own death in a way the novel, has, you know, the novel isn't dead, but it's been wearing mourning for quite a long time. Whereas cinema is, uh, has learned to live with television. Television companies are, are now sort of financing films, I and mean, that's been happening since My Beautiful Laundrette. But the, the way they feed into each other has no downside, as far as I'm concerned, except uh, the banality of product placement, the banality of music that tells you what you should know already. But if you're looking at a film on your mobile phone and in your commute, you need very simple cues yeah. through your ears to tell you what the meaning is. So yeah. I'm, I'm sympathetic. I just yeah. wish people wouldn't do it. Yeah. That's what Candy Crush was invented for. Exactly. To do something meaningless on your way to work. Uh, the one of the, or the cent, I'd say the centerpiece of the book is uh, cinematically challenged. You know, uh, yeah, it's my own, it's my little moral. Yeah, box. Um, yeah. Uh, and it, it, what what's interesting is, is 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 the piece itself, but also your kind of you know kind of reflection on it. Um, and kind of awareness of where it sits in your kind of interest, a uh, critical interest, we'll say. Um, but it does have a great, uh, uh, a great kind of breakdown of one of my favourite films of all time, which is Bad Day at Black Rock, mm. um, which you rarely see written about. And did you know that the one-handedness was added before? Yeah. Did, that, that it was added from the story, that it's yeah. not there in the story. Really interesting. You add a missing limb while making something for a medium where you're going to have to work really hard to make the missing limb work. Yeah. And also to put it, to, to give Spencer Tracy a missing limb and kind of the, the, sim, the symbolism of that up against Robert Ryan, Ernest Borgnine, Lee Marvin, just a, what, a, what a fascinating challenge to, to try and pull off in terms of, you know, tra the, I, I, Tracy's identity and their identity ah. and, what, and what happens in that, in that standoff. Plus um, the racial right on this about the Japanese. I mean, we're constantly seeing films which you suddenly think, oh my God, because some absolutely putrid attitude of the period is no longer possible to ignore. Mm. But the opposite happens with Bad Day at Black Rock. You think, wow, yeah. how did he get away with that? Why did you know, why was that not because it's it's uncomfortable. Mm. The yeah. stuff about about intern internment and the idea that this Japanese you know, it's it's a medal. He's delivering a medal. Uh, all of that is really really cool. Yeah, and how the kind of the, the kind of the, the genre setup plays into that, you know, that the or the that's say the genre, but that kind of the plot setup, you know, you're in a place where it's one day in, you know, it's, 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 it's one in, one out every day, you know, the train. So what, how people have to rationalise and contextualise their existence in those kind of places, which kind of speaks much broader mm. in terms of, you know, what we silence and what we don't talk about in order to get along, you know, it's kind of put, put under the kind of, the, the, the kind of the pressure cooker in that, in that film in such a brilliant way. Um, but the, when I was, when I was kind of like, when I was reading it, I was thinking about, the, the rock film San Andreas from a couple of years ago. But um, did the piece come across as, as sort of as tub thumping as sort of politically correct and annoying? Uh, because I can feel myself getting a bit pious. No, but I, and I think that one of the reasons is that it's still something that's not really written about. You know, and I know you're sort of saying, oh, you know, kind of taking on the the mantle of of it being your kind of platform, but there's not many people on that platform mm. you know so it was really interesting to there's to only see. one train a day <laughs> it's true that's true and you're on it every day um but uh but it it did make me think like yeah maybe there needs it, it, it's such a it's such a good thing to 
to kind of to keep coming back to because you don't see that kind of writing or thought with with, with regard to disability and you do talk about the kind of the Daniel Day Lewis my left foot um, and his you know his oh, I'm not gonna you know you should get an, another actor who's got cerebral palsy to do it but then obviously how do you get it funded and that that's what I was coming back to with the San Andreas mm. thing where you know the Rock is is a huge movie star. There, you couldn't do the movie for 150 million dollars mm. with mm. an actor with cerebral palsy, which suggests two things. One, obviously, is like you know that um, sometimes you need actors to portray in a certain context, but also that the problem is systemic. And how do you build? How do you build the? Uh, uh, how do you build film culture so that and film industry so that actors with disabilities are given the chance to develop careers, which then lead to yeah. those kind of movies, or if that's even possible? But it, it's tricky. I mean, I'm, I thought the version of Motherless Brooklyn, mm. directed by Edward Norton, uh, he's a writer. I've read other books of his in the past and really disliked them. But I thought on screen it worked. Well, you've not seen it. I've not yet. seen it, but I've read the book. Uh, yeah. But there, okay. Yeah. Uh, but the but the Tourette's. I don't see how a real person with Tourette's can play somebody with Tourette's because you would be Touretting in a different way. If you can't Tourette on script. That's the whole point. So that's a really tricky mm. one. And I think he's absolutely in the clear on that. Yeah, yeah. And after a while, you don't notice, mm. which is and that may be the you know, that may be the argument you could make in its favour is that once you're aware that this person is not all over the place but has a particular thinking pattern and talking pattern that reinforce each other, that he's got some weakness and some strengths, then it becomes a new normal for you. Yeah. And the next time you come across somebody who seems to be talking uncognitively, maybe you'll, you'll get it or maybe you'll give him the time or yeah. her the time to... Uh, there must be female Tourette's, but uh, it's not. It's not something that's great. Um, that, that's what's interesting is often these things are gendered, absolutely, uh, yeah. and unobtrusively so, uh, or we, or rather, we don't notice that they're gendered. And often it's because the symbolism of the disability has to do with either the possible objectification of a woman, so uh, uh, blindness. Uh, there are many more blind women uh, in movies than there are men, and deafness often women so that men have to interpret for them as if they didn't already uh, but wheelchair boundness although I think Alfred Woodard in uh, Passion Fish mm. John Sayles plays a cranky woman in wheelchair so uh, John Sayles as ever is, is very right on but by and large it's seen as tragic yeah. because uh, you know because power is masculine yeah. and a man with that power is somehow automatically more tragic than a woman yeah. and it, it just it was kind of one of those things where I was like I with with all of the conversations about representation, it doesn't feel as if disability on screen is it, it has the same uh, momentum as as race and gender in terms of you know do you, do you see do you see any kind of positive changes in terms of in, in the last few years in terms of that? Kind of <clears throat> I don't know, but I, I did think films like Awakening's got a very free ride, yeah. very indulgent, mm -hmm. and the way things about people overcoming their difficulties become about us. That's a mysterious mechanism, and I, I don't see quite that. Uh, and I, I hate, apart from the fact, uh, I, mean, I don't like being told that something is a feel-good movie, yeah. because that's not exactly what I go to the cinema with. If somebody, if they say it's exhilarating, then somehow that, that's different, yeah. because you can find the most extraordinary film <laughs> exhilarating. Uh, but the, the feel-good factor mm. seems to be just to say it is so unadventurous you will never be made to think an uncomfortable thought or uncomfortable feeling. Uh, I, I like the, the piece about, um, which I was able to title Being and Viscousness, which uh, I think the original magazine didn't uh, run with, about otherness. Yeah. And uh, you're giving the palm to Candy Clark going to the bedroom yeah. where David Bowie has revealed himself as a non-human creature and you're trying to start sex yeah. with him. I thought that's that's a fantastic moment. Yeah. Even at the time, I thought that was pretty amazing. In a film that I thought was a bit disappointing after Don't Look Now, which I thought was so incredibly wonderful. Yeah. And I I I would t tend to take my younger brother along to films without telling him anything about them. It'd be like, trust me, put you in front of something, and because. If you do read the reviews, then a lot of the film has, is already stale by the time it started playing. Yeah. And to be able to take an artificial virgin along and say, OK, you're not going to be prepared for this. You know, so I remember taking him along to, to Zelig. And if you've, if you've read a review of Zelig, if you've had all the jokes spoiled, there's nothing left because it's a pretty thin confection, really. Yeah. But for somebody who has no idea what it's going to be about, it's wonderful yeah. because it hasn't been, it hasn't been uh, spoiled to death. 
And I did the same with the first Luc Besson film. Not having seen it, in, in both cases, it was my first viewing, but it was lovely having somebody for whom it had no reference points at all. And I just said to my brother as we went into the Denier Cobas saying, um, I warn you, it is in French and there are no subtitles, but there's only one line of dialogue and I think it's bonjour. So I think he was okay with that. Do you know that movie? I don't it's know. Really yeah. fun. Yeah. It's really much more inventive than stuff he did later. Yeah. Uh, which is a kind of, yeah, just to kind of uh, touch, touch on that and then I've got one last question, which okay. is you mentioned about this idea of the masterpiece. Um, and I don't look now is, you know, a couple of films in. You know, I, I think what's interesting about when you were kind of uh, uh, aligning it with the, the kind of the art history idea of the masterpiece and the kind of becoming, you know, apprenticeship served kind of thing moment of, well, of there becoming two, a master. There are two masterpieces. Yeah. Did, I, did I talk about that? I can't remember. That you have to produce one masterpiece to be accepted uh, to be an apprentice uh, okay. and another to indicate that you've graduated. Which is, I think, right. there, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think that there's a lot of that in, in film in the sense of like the, the debut, the promise of the debut and then the, that kind of two or three films in where it's like the, 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 the kind of seem to be the films that are constantly referred back to or that contain everything at the, the apex, like Don't Look Now, which definitely it's such a complete work in a way that none of his other films are. And I, yeah. I think he's a really fascinating filmmaker and loves some of his stuff, but you, you can't deny Don't Look Now is such a complete package. But at the same time, that the medium of film, it goes from the tiniest things to huge mm. things. It's like a mixture of microsurgery and earth moving. And there must be people who've spent most of their career knowing that something has gone wrong in their current project, that it is unfixable, that what they're doing is trying not to have it run into a wall, yeah. trying to have it scrape through some aperture uh, in a way that has no comparison in, in writing books. You, books are fixable. Yeah. I mean, you may not quite find a way of doing it. Scripts, even to some extent, are fixable, but actually footage is not fixable. Mm-hmm. And the go-to place for fixing it is the is the voiceover, yeah. uh, which doesn't usually work. And, and, that, and that's one of the reasons to come back to Malik. I love the fact he sees uh, voiceover as a strong thing, as yeah. a strong element of film language. It isn't apologetic. It's it has never done a film without one, as far mm. as I can tell. No. And he really makes it work. Yeah. Uh, but I think the misery of knowing that you're going to be in debt for the rest of your life and your reputation is in shreds, uh, or will be in shreds, because you know that your current, pro- current project has not worked. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like it in, in other... There's, there's a story about Fellini, which I really like. Which was, if you were on a Fellini shoot, it was enormous fun. It was like a party every day. And at the end of the shoot, he would give a party. And it was the best party he'd ever been to. And at the end of it, he would wave you all along and say, darling, darling, we'll make another film next year. This was the best. This was the best ever. And then he's got his arm around Ruggiero Mastroianni, Marcello's brother, who is his editor. And after all the guests have gone, he climbs up the steps to the editing suite. And just before the door closes behind them, he turns to Ruggiero and says, now what are we going to do with all this shit? Brilliant. Um, That would be the perfect place to win, but I've got one one last question, um, which uh, is a very quick one. Have you now seen Charlie Varick? I did see it afterwards, yes. And I thought it was surprisingly harsh. I, there, like, there I really like it. Torture, yeah. Yeah. But there, there was torture in it which is almost sexually charged. Mm. I mean, we're, always, we're often being shown um, you know, unnecessary pain in films. And I find the torture in, uh, in Tarantino films shallow and active aggression against the, uh, the audience. Mm. But the, the gloating of that character, the sexual tinge to the pain caused... Do you, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was quite surprising. Also, um, the, the, what's, what's the name of the lead character? What's the matter? What's the matter? Uh, being given a romantic lead quite late in life. Yeah. And absolutely, right. not only that, but then usually Putin one. Isn't there one where they have sex on all, uh, on so, all yeah. aspects yeah, yeah, of yeah. the, who says we haven't done Northwest <laughs> yet? <laughs> uh, no, very good. And Don Siegel at his best. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the Don Siegel who... Clint Eastwood learned everything from except how to bring a film in less than 100 minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much for (laughs) joining me, Adam. Thank you. (laughs) In the far reaches of the galaxy, a civilization is under siege. We are all that is left. They've searched the universe for a leader. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's Galaxy Quest. Never give up. Never surrender. He will save us!
what they got. Never give up and never surrender. We're struggling TV actors. You are our last hope. Where's my limo? <laughs> Okie dokie. And they're about to put on a command performance. Eight million light years away. We are actors, not astronauts. You are our protectors. That was a hell of a thing. Now, Laredo, take us out. You gotta move to the right. Would you sit your ass down? You wanna drive this thing? Acting like heroes. The whole thing was just a misunderstanding. May not be enough. They look like little children. Huh? Hi, little guy. Oh, oh, darn. DreamWorks Pictures presents Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, Galaxy Quest. You're just gonna have to kill it. We'll go for the mouth to throw his vulnerable spots. It's a rocket that not any vulnerable spots. Thanks so much to Adam for his time and his generosity, and yeah, had a really, had a really good conversation with him. And yeah, Dario, what did you make of of our chat? Well, first of all, I thought that was a great interview. Perhaps one, of, you know, one of your best. I would say. I think it was a sort of really, you know, equal conversation between two film buffs, and he he clearly was put at ease quickly, and he's a good talker and. As you said, you know, at the beginning, at the top of the show, he's very articulate on the reasons why he did or didn't like something. Yeah. But then I think there's always an implication on even if he didn't like something or did like something, he's got the reasons for it. But again, they're his reasons. Yeah. They're not, not your reasons or anybody else's reasons, you know. And he wanted to know what you thought, which I think was refreshing. And I think that idea of it not being a and a and, you know, we've discussed the idea of, of interviewing on podcasts um, before. And, you know, the best ones do develop that sort of rhythm. And I think it did that really well. So, uh, yeah, great, great work there. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the, the, yeah, there's so many points. So maybe we can just sort of, we'll, 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 we'll just riff on them as we go, I suppose. But, I mean, the stuff you were talking about in terms of changing opinions... I think he's really interesting. And I, I, I thought it was fascinating that you admitted that you didn't, you don't tend to change your opinions too much. You know what I mean? Which is, which is an interesting one because I think I, I go backward and forward a lot actually on many things. I mean, I mentioned only lovers left alive at the top of the show. The big one for me are, are the, um, are the Coen brothers. Yeah. You know, like no country for old men. First time around, I was like, you know, yeah. Okay. And then second time, I was like, oh my God, this is probably as good a film as I've seen in 10 years, you know? And then inside Lewin Davis, I watched that quite recently again and was liked it so much better the second time around. And it's funny, we've been watching, um, me and B have watched films that a lot that I've seen, but she hasn't stuff that I think, you know, would be good to see. And even if it's a bit trashy or fun. So we, we, we've been watching some of the uh, late 80s, early 90s erotic thrillers in line with the, you know, the um, Fatal Attraction podcast. So, yeah. you know, we watched Fa um, Fatal Attraction. We watched Basic Instinct. Um, I mentioned Disclosure in the, in the newsletter. And then we watched um, Indecent Proposal which does not stand up at all. It's horrendous. It really is bad. I just remember that film being a big conversation starter at the time. And I just, rem I just thinking, oh my God, this, all of these people are existing in a, in a, like their own, their own sort of parallel universe that nobody in real life would ever act this way. You know, it's yeah. kind of interesting, but yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? That like coming back to, to films that maybe in your childhood you loved and, and then you're getting older and you see the flaws or even just admitting to yourself, I, I didn't give this enough due attention at the time or whatever. Yeah. I think it was, I mean, it, it definitely, it kind of took me by surprise that he was asking as well. So, you know, like you say, yeah. cause, cause I think, you know, can you, you always steal yourself to the the kind of the position where they might not be interested or they might just be quite you know like the interview might be quite tough because they've obviously not met him and so it was interesting and I hadn't really thought about it in a while and I think that yeah there's there is more nuance to that in the sense that there's you know we've talked about Fassbinder before that was someone I, I never yeah got on with first time round and now I can really see 
something different. I don't like all of his films, but I have a different appreciation um, for them. And I guess that I don't necessarily change my opinion in terms of whether I like it or not, but I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I think that indecent proposal thing, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say, oh, don't like this movie anymore because, you know, there's it's connected to a time when I wasn't the person I am now or whatever, but I can watch it and go, yeah, this is not, this is not a good movie, <laughs> you know. But I don't think it matters whether it's a good movie or not, and no, whether you like no. it. When when you revisit, I think well, not, not that it ever matters anyway. But you know, I think that there is, I think it's interesting to go back and see how how you feel about things, and a lot of the stuff I've kind of, I've grown out of. I think you know exactly the same with me. You know, and that's okay, isn't it? Like, you know, even like Star Wars and stuff. Like, I, I'll rewatch the first Star Wars, and I can see. I can see the person I was when I watched that stuff and that makes me feel good. But in terms of my engagement with the film as it's playing out, it's, it's not the same. And it's like, okay, I'm 42 now. It's fine. <laughs> but again, it, it's interesting, isn't it? That, that you go on to, you go onto social media or you go into the, the marketplace of film fandom. And there are so many people who are, you know, people you respect and, and, and are great writers or great academics and stuff like that. And they're still, they're still on the Star Wars trip. And like, I don't, mm. part of me wants to go, you know, grow, you know, grow up a little bit. You know what I mean? I I'm, <laughs> I'm, know I'm going to upset people by saying that, but do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, surely yeah. you, you need to get off of that now or, or move along or, or not. I mean, I don't know. What is it about that that they, they, is it that sense of the connection to what it means to them in their childhood? Do they genuinely believe that, this, that these films have, are so profound that they stay with you, you know, through the ages, become different things, and because of the recycling of them, then they mean different things at different ages. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. It's yeah. it's a funny one to me. That yeah, it, it, yeah. I'm curious about it, and kind of sometimes frustrated that there's not the space to really get into it like we do here. You know, so you kind of end up having those questions about why. And I think you can see with some with some critics or or academics, you can see how those sort of films have formed their academic identity and you can see their research is 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 rooted around that you know and, and I, I yeah, get that yeah. like okay yeah I can see I can see why you are investigating this text over and over again say when people do with Hitchcock or whatever that but it is the generalist thing that I just think that and I sort of mention it in the conversation like my tastes have changed you know I'm most yeah, excited yeah, about yeah, seeing yeah. the new Sai Ming Ling film at um, at Berlin and before we did this podcast I didn't know who that was you know and yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the idea that there's still so much to see that I have no idea about is is where I kind of get my excitement rather than going back to to stuff over and over again yeah mm. but but I, it's it, interesting yeah but it leads us doesn't it onto what he said about sort of I mean he mentions the sort of different identities in relationship to film that we hopefully on the podcast kind of cross crisscross across so fandom and cri or fans and critics and then he mentions experts as well mm. and i think it's interesting that he, he he sort of makes that differentiation and 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 he did sort of argue that that fandom is this commercially driven underpinning especially today i think he was he was sort of intimating towards but making that distinction then between being a critic and being an expert which i thought was really fascinating because even when he was talking about writing the ozu book that he didn't go and read the the previous literature and was making yeah. the making the assertions and the interpretations of the film without that background, which you know, if if you if you put that in an academic context, you're saying, well, that's actually bad academic practice. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But that's not what a critic is interested in, because no. the, the the text and their relationship to the text and their interpretation of the text is the the primal negotiation that is going on in that relationship. Whereas obviously with an academic, there is a, 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 an un, a, a, a need to place it in the wider academic, social, historical context. Yeah. And just listening to him talk about those moments in that film, I was like, wow, what a, what a specific thing you're doing. And it, it, it did feel like criticism in a, in a, in a sense that feels I don't want to say old-fashioned, but definitely something that is, you know, is a certain kind of older idea of what criticism is and, and how yeah. and, and, and how the act of criticism is performed, which, you know, and we've talked a lot of, 
with film critics in terms of what it is nowadays and it definitely feels like the blend of fandom criticism and academia are kind of much more blurry than for someone yeah. like Adam who really kind of understands what he thinks his role is yeah, and not, not only that but is absolutely committed to to seeing that through um, and able to do such a wonderful job of it yeah and when he said exactly that and he said I commit myself with the full knowledge that I could be wrong yeah and accepting that you know what I mean whereas you know obviously the the academic is saying well it, it, it could be this and it could be could be that and then I'm going to synthesize ideas to come up with a you know, a, 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 not not a summary or a summation, but a kind of development of what the lineage of of knowledge is, let's say, in relationship yeah. to a, a, a you know a piece of a piece of art or whatever it might be. But he's just kind of like, no, this is what it is for me, and you know, you can argue with me that you're wrong, that I'm wrong. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and it, it'd be interesting to, to 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 sort of talk to him maybe again a bit more about that that sense of when do you get convinced what would convince you that you are wrong because if he's not hmm. if it's all on the 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 subjective interpretation you know and and you know obviously he's an extremely smart guy and and that that subject that subjectivity doesn't come from nowhere it comes from a knowledge of film and and you know an art criticism and all of that kind of thing anyway but to convince you that you're wrong you would have to take you outside of that it would seem to me yeah yeah in the book, he talks about Alien 3 and is convinced right. that Alien 3 is better than Aliens. You know? <laughs> right. But And then when yeah. you read it and see how he traces it back to Alien and the relationship between yeah. Alien 3 and Alien yeah. and what he gets from that story and that film and then the, the kind of the follow-up, it is convincing in, this, yeah. in the sense yeah. of not, you're not, I don't go, oh, but it's kind of, the, I, I can see how you would read Alien that way and then see how Aliens absolutely jumps the shark in terms of that, what that film does. Yeah. yeah. Although you could also see that it is deeply connected in many ways. But it's yeah. kind of, like you say, it's taking, a, it's taking a point of view and following that point of view through. And then, mm. you know, and being able to articulate that, I think, is, 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 is kind of rare, really. Um, and to just be comfortable, just to know that everyone thinks Aliens is, if not... But, but oh, yeah, most people think it's better than Alien Three, but certainly some people think mm. it's better than Alien, you know, and yeah, and not to take it as a contrarian point of view. Like that was the thing about reading the book. None of none of his reviews were contrarian for the, you know, they were just like say his his informed opinion and what he's able to share in terms of his knowledge of classical music and literature and things like that is is you really feel how he's arriving at based on the cultural. Uh, the cultural life he's he's lived which is yeah kind of mm. yeah kind of feels yeah it, it feels like the kind of criticism you don't see very much of so it's kind of nice yeah. that there's a collection out there that collects it and I didn't quite get the chance to ask him it, as the follow-up to why he's done the book because it definitely feels like both in film and music criticism there is a lot of books now that are releasing these collections yeah. and it seems like kind of to to have in that form the the statement of what criticism was for a period of time in regards to, you know, in the way that an, almost an acknowledgement that it has changed in terms of what critics are expected to do and what people emerging into criticism are doing based on mm. how the internet and everything has to kind of change fandom and criticism and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it sort of indirectly links as well to the way he sort of talked about kind of Lynch and Malick and Scorsese, and then Kubrick. But I love that question that he asked, or you asked him, and then you talked about it, about whether Lynch and Malick watch their own, watch other people's movies. I mean, it's yeah. obviously, and, and, and that idea that someone like Scorsese is han almost handicapped by his silly literacy. Yeah. Whereas Lynch and Malick, because they're not kind of imbibing these other people's work, or they don't look to reference all the time, particularly probably Malik, you know? Yeah. They're, they're, that, that gives them a sense of freedom that their, their filmmaking is a, is a language unto itself. Yeah, you know? good way of putting it. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting how the, the sort of reading of that. And then, you know, again, fascinating on, on Kubrick just being sort of the technical cleverness 
in the ability to reverse or change up filmmaking conven- conventions and get them to work for him in his particular his particular style. So he's almost kind of like a. a it's almost like he named him a, a, an anti auteur auteur. So his auteurism is his ability to 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 not do not do coherent things in many ways. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Change things around and and reverse what the expectation would be on an aesthetic level, which is, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, because he's kind of res- always responding to what's in front of him, which is similar to what Adam's been, I suppose, you know, rather than, yeah, a kind of preconceived ideas or even subconscious ideas that are kind of coming out again and again, which is why I think it's interesting to read his book and, and you know, he likes bits of films and sort of sees bits of films as incredible and some bits as just not hitting the mark, you know, which is fascinating. Yeah. I think, yeah, the Lynch and the Malik thing is... It was interesting to think about that because, and then I was thinking, obviously, neither of them care, you know, that that what other people think. No. But Lynch is Lynch is kind of obviously interested in pop and movie lore and culture and iconography. Like that's a lot, you know. He might not watch movies, but he's definitely interested in like Americana and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Of course. Whereas Malik is not, and I think that the, the latter Malik. Which kind of made me want to revisit some of it um, and visit some of it because I haven't even seen. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no pop culture point for anyone to get in on. So if you're not on his wavelength of really earnest philosophical wandering, yeah. then yeah. Which I think you can. And when he was talking, I was like, yeah, I, I can see why that frustrates people. Oh you yeah. Know, even critics, because it's like where that was what linked me to kind of when we we're talking about the art thing um, in art galleries and stuff like where, where do you get in? And I think that. Malik doesn't give you any. You, you, there's no way to get in, you know. No, no, no. Because he's probably one of the only filmmakers who isn't interested in emotion or intellectual kind of uh, rigor. Let's mm. say he's interested in in. It's almost like you know the closest there is to going to church, and you know, <laughs> especially in the West, you know, in the UK, especially sort of going to church is not big on people's agenda, is it really? You know, especially if you want if. if you know, if you put it alongside going, to, you're going to see a movie. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting that it, that that it, it is a he is a singular filmmaker. I think yeah. uh, Malik, in the, especially in the context that we're in today. Yeah, and then and then just finally the stuff on on film music, I thought was really really interesting. And that idea, I mean, it's funny because he again he he's almost got this kind of old fashioned take where he says he doesn't. He's almost sort of saying I don't like melodrama, but he likes it when it's nuanced and restrained. And scores just at the right moment, but just this kind of telling me what I already know through the music is not, you know, is not something that he particularly likes. And then, you know, g- giving one up for uh, for voiceover and that ha- how good a device it is, because I think you know sometimes it's it is just dismissed as a cheap a cheap way of of getting expositional points across. But but just listen, you know, doing doing my doing this voice episode. The importance and the use of voiceover, it just can't be, you know, overstated in film, I don't think. No, absolutely. And yeah, when kind of I, I teach screenwriting, as you know, and it comes up a lot, you know, and you sort of see it used a lot. And it's like, well, you've, you've just, you've, you've hit a wall <laughs> and you think that explaining, and it's the Blade Runner thing, isn't it? You know, we'll just have, we'll have it all explained over the top so that people get it. And it's like, mm. well, that's, it's not, whereas someone like Malik is using it in a very, very specific way. And it's part of the fabric of the filmmaking that he wants to do. So it's never just giving you information on top. It's always doing something else, um, you know, and, and some of the great Hollywood directors, writer directors like Billy Wilder used it beautifully. Yeah. Um, and there's a great example recently. I mean, you pointed it out, Mudbound. Yeah. The Reese's film was a uh, really brilliant use of yeah, voiceover. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Just the way it kind of allows you into different perspectives. Um, yeah. But again, it's understanding what, what the capabilities of the medium are when considered against what's in front of you and the story that you, you're trying to tell or the film that you're trying to make um, rather than just a blanket. Oh, it would be great to just feel that, you know, have this kind of over the top. And one of the, you know, uh, Mean Streets and Scorsese, you know, the Mean Streets voiceover is Scorsese talking about you don't make up yeah. for your sins in the church, you, you know, you do it in the streets. And it's like, oh God, what, this, <laughs> this isn't any of the characters and it's the director. Say so, you know, like you know, when when you feel that and learn that, it kind of it does it does something different that really kind of yeah 
changes uh, your experience of the film. Yeah. No, it's just just great all around. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. It's going to be interesting for you to hear my chat with Blake Howard, which I think is a very different kind of chat, I yeah. think. So, but, but that sort of comparison about how an interview goes based on the, the interests and the personalities and the kind of people that you're talking to is always just a, you know, a fascinating thing, I think, about, about podcasting. Yeah, and, w- and what's been enjoyable about doing ours is the range of different types of conversations we get to have. You know, it was a yeah. really enjoyable conversation. I'm very grateful to Adam for being up for a chat, you know. And again, it yeah. comes from the confidence he has in his writing and his work. So, yeah, yeah really yeah, yeah. really enjoyed it and, and hope people did. Glad you did and hope other people do as well. Wonderful. So um, I think that will just about do it for our first episode of the new season. Um, thank you very much to all our listeners for sticking with us. If you want to get in touch, please do on the usual channels. We're on social media. We're obviously on email at Cinematologists on Twitter uh, cinematologist at gmail.com on email and please if you if you have the means and you feel so inclined and you want to uh, support us just in our running costs um, please go to the patreon page and subscribe it's only still we haven't you know we haven't moved it it's still two dollars fifty a month as so we're everything Americanized currency but you do get our bonus material and our monthly newsletters which uh, I, I mean, I think people are enjoying, aren't they? The, the subscribers, they like the uh, the newsletters. They're still subscribing, which always tells me yes. that they're not. Yeah, that they are. They are going down a treat. Um, yeah, I, I, we really enjoy doing them now. Um, yeah. Not that we didn't before, but you know, we, it's become a staple part of the of the process, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it, yeah, it's a it's a it's become a really yeah a really good end to the month in terms of a piece of writing that you know yep. kind of collects a lot of the things we've been thinking about and doing it's been really it's i find it quite rewarding so grateful yep. that people are responding and i do get some messages sometimes from people who've read it who i know are subscribers and say oh you know yeah that sounds great or whatever so thank you so much for yeah your continued support brilliant so i shall see you in a few days neil in in berlin or being well I know, yeah, touch wood. I will see you there. Can't wait. So this has been episode 96 of the Cinematologist podcast. Thanks for listening. Staring